Hello there. This is a very cheap Santoku knife. This is, uh, I bought this knife for like $7 or $10, so something like that at Big Lots. Now this knife has a feature that I love, but a lot of people don't like, and it has a bolster. That's this part of the, the knife here. Okay, I like it because I like the way, when I go to use the knife, I like the way that bolster feels back behind this thumb and particularly where my finger lays against it here. Okay, but there's a feature of these knives that turn a lot of people off to the bolsters. One, and number two, they're Japanese style knives which typically don't have a bolster or the, all the rage now and uh, so this style of knife is falling out of favor in that regard too but the reason that a lot of people don't like these knives is because as you sharpen a knife with a bolster you get this right here and what happens is when you lay that flat on the, on the uh, cutting board there'll be a little gap here this part of the Knife will not touch the board anymore. So if you're using that right up next to that bolster, which I don't ever do, I use this portion. Actually, I use like from here to here because I generally do the uh, European style rocking motions and things of like that. That's the way I learned to cut food and work in a kitchen. I taught myself that. Uh, and uh, that's the style I prefer, which is why I prefer more Western knives than something like this Santoku, or San yeah Santoku I think is what it's called. Uh, but I just bought it because I like the look of it. I rarely ever use the knife, but you see that I do use. I have used it enough to cause that issue. Well, what do you do with this? Well, this issue. And learning how to correct this issue is part and parcel of owning knives like these. And if you own knives like these, then you need to understand, or the person that you get to sharpen the knife needs to understand that that has to be corrected every now and then. Now, if you look at this, I've done a little bit of correction. You see how that slants back? I've did it, done a little, but I'm what I want to do is I want to take that little nipple or heel or whatever you want to call that out of this. Bolster, and I'm going to turn this on the side. We're going to. This is a 180 degree Atoma plate. You can do this with a 120 or 150, 180 grit oil stone, whichever one you want. But basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay that little. Because what I don't want to do is I don't want to lay it like this. Because when I get to grinding on that, it's going to grind that edge too. I don't want to do that any more than I have to. So I'm going to pick a corner of this stone. And I'm rolling it like this. Because what I don't want to do is end up having to really work really hard on that bevel edge there. Because I'll just end up turning it like that. I want to kind of move the knife side to side to try to make that as thin as I can so that I don't have to do a whole lot of work sharpening it and end up right back where I started. This does not take very long at all and uh, this, like I said this type of thing is a part of owning this style of knife and if you are going to own it you're going to need I understand hey my stone is slipping a bit let me tighten it you're going to need to understand how to deal with that
Now, I don't know if this is the way people correct this or not. I know that this is the way I correct it. And it's my knife. I don't really give a flying hoot what anybody else thinks about it. I want it to work for me. And this is not a perfect situation, but it is what it is what I'm going to do. Okay, I still got a little bit of gap there. Not much. Now, since I am close, I'm going to kind of lay that flat. The thing you have to understand is that that's a whole lot more steel than that. So you want to grind. See how what I'm doing is I'm kind of lifting it up and just working on this area of the knife. But I don't want it to look ugly or out of place. So I'm still going to continue, continue to rock the knife back and forth. Now you see where, I've, where I'm at? That is lower here and here. So now... watch that I don't tighten them up as much so I want to okay now you might be confused because of the bevel because we don't have as much we don't hardly have any bevel back at this very tip but that lays flat all the way down the edge I'm gonna hit it a few more times just to give it what for first thing I'm going to do is tighten them down a little bit more but you see I have a basically a flat there I want to Kind of reshape that, and uh, what I'll do is I'll work that area. On successive stones until I polish it out. All right. That should be perfectly fine. What I'm going to do now is actually sharpen this stone or this knife. For that, I'm going to start with my 
300 grit ultra sharp plate. And this is not a standard way that I would sharpen this. I'm trying to fix that bevel. And bring it back. What I want to do is I want to go straight down because what I'm trying not to do is pull this edge across the stone and cause a recurve. So. All right, that should be plenty of the blend stroke. So now we're going to work toward a burr like we always do. And you want to sharpen these at fairly a fairly shallow angle. I'm not, I don't really, you know, people go, well, you sharpen a knife at a 22 degree or a 26, 5 degree or 22 and a half degrees or I don't worry about it. I just choose an angle I think is right if I'm reprofiling for the knife that I'm using. And that's where it is. Wanted to pull that some more because I want to really be cognizant of the fact that that area of the bevel is fatter than the rest of it because of the reprofiling work that I've done. But I mean, if you stop and think about it, just, let's wipe this off. If I'm holding the knife like this, I'm really not ever going to cut there. Uh, unless I'm pushing the knife up into, or pushing the knife into the food, pushing this corner up into the food, that's really not going to happen. But there's no reason not to get that just as sharp as the rest of the blade. Alright, we have the the bevel established. You see that it's ooh, smack the camera. All right, clean and straight, and that problem is gone now. This is a Suhiro 
1200 grit stone. This is a 300 grit that uh, that I just used to clean up what that 180 grit water stone or diamond stone did. What I'm going to do, I'm not really flattening this stone, although I am. I, I want this slurry. Uh, I find that a lot of times the slurry helps the stone. I don't know if I would say it, it helps it cut more aggressively, but because what's rolling over the top of this is, this is my thought anyway, what's rolling over top of this bevel is 1200 grit slurry. It's whatever amount of, I don't want to say polishing because I don't really consider a 1200 grit a, a polishing stone of any kind. But this is a good finish for a kitchen knife in my experience. You can go higher and will go higher by using a, a strop with a chromium oxide compound put in it but uh it helps it remove the scratches from the 300 grit that are left on this bevel so what we're doing is basically i removed most of the burr on that 300 before i moved up to this stone but diamond stones one thing you'll learn if you use them enough is that in my experience the burr off of a diamond stone is much more tenacious I still got a little bit of that burr. It's much more tenacious than what you'd find off of a water stone or off of a oil stone or anything like that. And I might have to, if I can get the burr small enough, I might end up having to uh, use a a pasted strop to kind of get rid of that final bit of burr that's left. And one of the reasons that I don't do a boatload of sharpening with diamond stones is because of that. The other reason is that I like a stone stone a whole lot better than a diamond stone. So I got a bit of a burr still on that side. I'm going to do some pulling with that. See if I can remove it. not using any pressure I'm just yeah I'm just worrying that burr from one side to the other no biggie and we'll just now, if you look at this knife, the profile of this knife, there's just the slightest bit of curve. If I come like this and lift up, I'm going to tear that. I'm going to reshape that bevel there. So what I'm doing is I'm coming down and I'm trying to stay. I'm lifting a little, but I'm trying to stay as straight on that 
edge as I can, as, on that tip as I can, because I know that it's just a tiny bit of lift, and I want to strive to keep this bevel like it is, and not change it in any kind of way. Now you could do the that a lot of Japanese chefs I don't see I don't do it so I don't a lot of Japanese chefs sharpen that way and you'll see it on all the Japanese knife sharpening videos and a lot of the Western stuff. Uh, in my opinion, it's a whole lot easier to maintain a bevel angle if you're just pulling than if you're doing this right here. Your wrist can do all sorts of things. And you can learn to do it, and I'm not knocking anyone that does, but for my preference, this is just simple. Easy. And I think the bevel's more consistent. See, the thing of it is... Oh, that's that. Here we go. I don't know if you can see it or not. I lost it. Where'd it go? Anyway. What ended up on the stone, I can't find it, but I felt it roll up under... There it went. Where the heck did it go? I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not. But that's that burr. That was on the edge of the knife. Sometimes they will pop off of the knife edge. As you sharpen and what I found, everybody to their own experience and all of that. What I found is, as you go up the higher grits, they tend to remove a burr more readily. If you get too coarse of a grit, what will happen is that the stone cuts so aggressively, like that 300 grit diamond plate. That thing cuts really aggressively so that I can, and I just saw another piece of the burr, but I can't find it now. So that I can remove some of that burr. But I can't remove all of that burr. Because the stone is aggressive enough that it's constantly cutting steel fairly aggressively. And it's just... Building another burr, if I, if I manage to get most of the burr off of it, if I stay on the stone too long, even with super light pressure, what I end up with is another flipping burr. So, that's one of the reasons when you move it, you take, you remove the burr on that lower grit stone or as much of it as you can possibly get off. And then you move up and you do very light alternating passes on the higher grit stones. Because if you're pressing to a higher grit stone, it'll cut more aggressively unless, you know, unless it's really super hard. But it's fine enough that it will polish that edge if you use light strokes, but it'll peel or help to peel that burr off just like if you were using a, wow, that's going to be lovely, a strop. We're going to go a bit longer on this stone.
because that's cutting hair, but I want it to be as fine as I can get it before I take it to a, a strap loaded with chromium oxide. Another thing that you can do is you can go to like a chromium oxide strop, clean that off of the edge once you're done stropping there, and then go to leather. Just plain slick leather. Or you can come off of this stone and go to plain slick leather. Uh, a lot of leather has fine silicates in it that will lovely that will cut very finely and uh, like polishing anyway and uh, that can give you a lovely edge as well just a clean smooth leather strop Just checking the time, excuse me. Once it's learned the, the mechanical motions of sharpening and they are ingrained within your body mechanics, then the speed will come if you want it. I find myself going fast just because I'm not really paying attention and uh, it's an instinctive thing with my body now with my hands and all of that to move in such a way as to maintain that angle but takes time and the thing it is is in a lot of times in my opinion anyway that's lovely people are too blooming worried about speed do you not want to do it uh, you know if you just if you're so I want to hit that some more worried about speed that you can't take the time to learn form then you're always going to pretty much get the mediocre edges and that applies to any kind of sharpening any type or style even like like that Japanese those Japanese half strokes where you basically you're you're moving the knife across the stone like this. Uh, you got to learn that technique. And in my opinion, that technique is harder to get right in the beginning than this technique. And so that's why I teach this because the nothing. Breed success like success. And the more you struggle with trying to get an edge, the longer it takes you to start getting good edges, the more you're likely to just throw it all down and say, forget it. And uh, 
that's not conducive to lovely. All right, that's not conducive to proper learning. If you're gonna use a knife for food, this stuff should not end up in the food. So you wanna clean that bevel really, really good so that that doesn't happen. But that's the sharpening. This is just like memo paper or whatever you wanna call it. It's basically just a little notebook. Yeah. Oh, see? What happens when you try to be all fancy? But, yeah. I think that cuts perfectly fine. I don't think there'll be any kind of issues with sharpness. And you see... The knife is repaired and ready to work. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you later.